I'm here to talk about memory. Uh, I'm a memory scientist. I, in particular, study memories about things that never happened. So why we believe in illusions, why we believe that we did things that we didn't. And I've recently come to realize that there is an overlap between what I do and what certain politicians do, where they maybe try to convince us that we did things or saw things or remember things that maybe didn't happen. And so I want to tell you about some particular memory tricks, some memory illusions that trick us into potentially not trusting experts. But first, crucially, I think it's important to establish what a memory actually is. A memory is a network. A memory is a network of neurons, of brain cells, that are scattered often all across the brain. And this is why we have pieces, we have nuggets of information, we have experiences, we have emotions, we see things, we hear things, we taste things, when we relive autobiographical experiences. The same is true for information. There's networks of things that fit together. And what we know from memory science is that this network, while it can last an incredibly long time, it's also incredibly fragile. So we're all familiar with forgetting, which is essentially cutting connections between these brain cells in a way that loses a piece from the network, and that piece of information is forgotten. We're also potentially familiar with what I do, which is making mistakes. You remember something in a way that it didn't happen quite right. Or you maybe even remember an event, a childhood event maybe, a discussion, a dispute, in a way that it didn't really happen, and that's what we call a false memory. And that's when this network is recombined in a way that it originally wasn't structured. So memory is a network. And within this network, what we're also finding repeatedly in science is that memory, in many ways, creates your reality. You could even argue that memory is your reality. And by that, I mean that everything you think you've ever done, everything you think you've ever learned, language, Everything you perceive is influenced by your memory. And this memory, even for important events, even for events like emotional childhood events or committing crimes, can be heavily flawed. And we can think that we committed a crime that we never committed, or that we took a hot air balloon, that never, hot air balloon ride that never took place. And we say and talk about these memories that never happened in ways that are highly confident, highly emotional, and highly complex. These false memories feel as real as real experiences. And this is where the problem enters, is that memories are reality, and these memories are shaky at best. And certain people, and even just your brain tricking you, can make you believe even more fictions in a more systemic way. One of the things that systematically leads to you misremembering your past and misremembering the past of the country that you live in is something called rosy retrospection. Now, some of us are probably familiar with the idea that when you look back upon things, sometimes you perceive them to have been better than they actually were. Now, there's actually some really fun science on this that suggests that if we measure people before, during, and after events, and we measure their enjoyment, before, people generally overestimate how enjoyable something's going to be. Let's say a trip to Disneyland. They said, it's going to be great. They go to Disneyland. What happens? The weather's bad. They're disappointed. They're waiting for things. There's realities that enter, which they didn't predict, which they didn't account for, that diminish their enjoyment of Disneyland. But, and this is really important, these effects fade. The memory of these interferences, of these unpredicted negative pieces, fade within just a few days. And a week later, a year later, a decade later, you're telling your trip to Disneyland in a much more rosy way than it actually took place. Now, that's not just true for Disneyland. That's true for life. And so when we think about our past, especially if we're over 40, because that's where I'm going to go next, we have something called a reminiscence bump, which means that on the one hand, there's this enhancement of our lives, which probably has something to do with maintaining our Identity maybe has something to do with making sure that we're survivally still ready for action. We're not depressed and sitting in a corner and moping about our lives. We're thinking, actually, life is pretty good, and I should keep going. 
But there's also this other thing that comes in, this reminiscence bump. The reminiscence bump suggests that most of us, cross-culturally, have a bump, have an increase in the amount of memories that we have from the ages between 10 and 25. So if you think back upon your life, especially if you're over the age of 40, there is an increase, a dramatic increase in memories for this time period. Why? One theory suggests it has to do with your identity. These are the times of your life when you define who you are. These are the autobiographical memories that make you, you. Now, there's another one which says, well, they're also the first. It's your first kiss, your first job, your first everything, really. Things that matter. And we remember firsts better because there's something called a primacy effect. We remember firsts better than lots of other things. And so the combination of these things suggests that we have this bump. Now this bump happens to correlate, especially when we put it together with rosy reminiscence, with political decision making. We see that, for example, in Brexit, 40 was about the cutoff for people who were voting to leave the EU as opposed to, to remain in the EU. And while this is totally spurious, and I'm just guessing, uh, I would suggest that this might have to do with memory and how it works over certain ages. Because people over 40 who voted for Brexit could remember the, the UK before the EU. And potentially, they had a biased view that said, wow, with my rosy reminiscence and my reminiscence bump, Things were great, even though maybe they weren't as great. Now, that's, of course, just one reason why people make political decisions or people make decisions in general. But it might be a really important one. And it's a rhetoric that we're hearing over and over and over again, make our countries great again. And it's a rhetoric that is obviously flawed, because if you look back at history, maybe we're actually doing pretty good on lots of things. Now. If you have your memories, your memories making you who you are, your memories of your life, you trust these memories. You trust your memories of fact. This is true for scientists and for everybody else. This is true. You trust that you remember information correctly. You remember your life correctly. And generally, your favorite expert is yourself. Now, along comes a contrarian also known as another expert, or just an expert in an area, who's telling you something you don't want to hear. They're telling you the opposite of what, when you check your memory bank, your memory is saying. Your memory is saying, things were great. I remember so much. And this person is saying, actually, things were pretty tough back then. Now, this is a discord. And this is a discord in a way that I think is crucial to understand. Because these false memories essentially lead to us immediately saying, Either you're wrong, or I don't trust you. Why are you lying to me? And what this leads to is an explosion of, essentially, realities. Because what we've got is we've got me with my memories relying on my experiences, my ideas, my thoughts. And I've got you coming in as an expert, probably with some sort of scientific evidence, with things that are maybe falsifiable and replicable, but they have nothing to do with me personally, and maybe I haven't come across them before. And my evidence doesn't match yours. And what I suggest to you is that what this means is that rather than saying we need to give people more information so that they trust us, what we need to remember is that it's not just an information clash, it's a reality clash. I've got my own reality, which is different from anybody else's. And that reality is based largely on memories. And if you come at me and say, that's wrong, then I'm going to flat out reject you. So we need to engage in a way that says, it's not just information. It's more than that. There are epistemological differences here that we really need to head on address. And so when we're talking about trust, what we need to do is we need to get people out of the dark. And by people, I mean everybody. We all need to be realizing that things like memory are fundamentally flawed, that the way that we perceive the world is distorted, it's personal, it's biased. And that when we talk about trusting experts or trusting the public or not trusting experts or not trusting the public, perhaps both of those tenets are problematic. 
perhaps what we shouldn't do is trust our memories. And perhaps this should lead to all of us realizing, when we realize that false memories, memories of things that never actually happened are everywhere, it leads us to realize that misremembering the past can and does threaten our future. And the only way around this, the only way to stop misinformation and false memories from guiding our decision making today is to question reality. And that means, again, everybody needs to question their reality. Always seek independent, falsifiable, replicable evidence for important decisions you're trying to make, for important ideas you have. Because just because you're an expert, or just because you're not, it doesn't mean you're safe from false memories. Thank you.